Little people can do big things, and we're thankful to our children's choir for leading us in worship this morning. I understand that they're a little short and that our third grade Bible presentations have been rescheduled because of a Boy Scout camping trip that sort of took a big group out. And so, Riley, if you'll come ahead and lead our call to worship... This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in this day. This is the place where the Lord has called us. Let us gather in this place as the people of God. This is the hope with which the Lord has filled us. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the good of humankind. Amen. Amen. The hymn is number 466, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, hymn number 466.
please join me in the invocation as we pray together. O oh God, we are gathered this day to be reminded of your goodness and filled with goodness to share with others. O oh God, we are gathered this day to be reminded of your grace and filled with grace where we have need. O oh God, we are gathered this day to be reminded of your wisdom and filled with wisdom where we have need. These things we pray in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, God has provided exceedingly and abundantly for all of our needs. Thanks be to God. Please read responsively with me from Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. Who can utter the mighty things of the Lord? Happy are those who observe justice. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them. Let me see the prosperity of your chosen ones. So that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation. So that I may glory in your heritage. Amen. Amen.
The Lord is King. Thank you, choir, for leading us so beautifully in worship. And in a similar vein, our hymn is Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Hymn number eight, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
the epistle reading comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, thy prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Shortly after moving to Teleco Village in October of 2005, I received an invitation to be a part of a men's nonfiction book group. This rather distinguished group would be one of those things I would come to learn several things about through my nearly 11 years in Teleco Village. I learned that this group in its inception had been designed to reflect a variety of opinions. It had intentionally been composed of a fairly balanced number of people who saw the world one way and another group who saw the world the other way. I also learned that this group liked to read all sorts of things. In my time with them, we read everything from Richard Dawkins to Sarah Palin and anything you might imagine in between there and learned some things from some of them and maybe not as much as we'd hoped from others. I also learned that this group, when it would engage in discussion, rarely ever saw the world the same way. If one part of the group was on one path to get to a destination, the other part of the group was certain that you should take the other path to get there. And that often invoked some rather spirited discussion. But I learned most importantly about this group that no matter whether they thought it was this path or this path that would most successfully get you to where you were going, none of them were willing to go without others, even if they were people with whom they disagreed on the path to travel. I think it is something of this that Paul has in mind when he addresses the church at Philippi in today's epistle reading. This favorite of Paul's churches obviously has a conflict within it. A conflict that we'll see in a moment has a couple of names attached to it. And Paul's concern is that this community not be torn apart by the conflict, but that the community find some way to get through this conflict, to grow from this conflict, to become stronger on the other side of the conflict. It seems to me that the very first thing that Paul assumes in the portion of Scripture that we've heard read today is that the question of conflict in a community is a question of when 
and not if. Paul sort of assumed, as we all know, that if more than one person is gathered in a place, there's at least three opinions there, and those opinions will create some sharp discussion and perhaps some uh, difference of, of direction and a little bit of unsettledness for a community, whatever size it is. I suspect that Paul thought about the community much in the way that my funeral director friends and I always thought about a conversation that we would have at memorial services. Now this is a bit of a dark illustration, but I think you'll get the point. It was that sort of thing where the funeral director or funeral directors and I would be standing around either preparing for or being on the other side of a memorial service, and someone who had attended would inevitably come up to us and say, if something happens to me, I want you guys to take care of it. As soon as that person was gone and a safe distance away from our hearing, we would look at each other and say, you know, it's not a question of if something happens, it's when something happens. And it seems that Paul understood that, even about this most beloved of his communities, that conflict was going to come, that differences of opinion would arise, that difficulties would result from that, but it didn't have to break the community. It didn't have to derail their purpose. They could work through it and become better after it. And so I think Paul's word to us would be much as it was to the Philippians, recognize that conflict is going to come. Recognize that conflict is inevitable. And find a way to work through and grow from the conflicts that are a part of living in community. I think Paul also is writing to this church to remind them of the fact that one of the other things we know about conflict is it is almost always personal at some level. Betty asked me before church began today, now how is it that I'm supposed to pronounce these names? And I said, Betty, however you pronounce them will be fine with me because I'm not certain exactly how you odia and syntyche are supposed to be pronounced, but that's the way I've always pronounced it. I did hear somebody say one time they thought that perhaps these two were fighting over who had been the most poorly named at birth. <laughs> that may be true. I suspect the conflict was a little deeper than that, but the nature of having two names there is a reminder to us that this is not just some sort of general problem in a larger group. This is a problem that has names attached to it. This is a problem that represents lives that are diverging from each other that need to come together. This is a problem that needs to be solved because it's not just about A or B, it's about Euodia and Syntyche, your neighbor or your neighbor or your friend Paul knew that conflict was almost always personal. And because of that, it needed to be solved. Because it was not just a generalized anxiety, it was an anxiety attached to particular people and particular names who meant something to the other people within this community. Now remember how this letter would have first been heard in order to get the full impact of these names being present. In the early church, what typically happened is Paul would write a letter. And then the church, probably not quite as large as we are here today, but maybe about this size, would assemble in pretty much the same way. And the bishop of the church would get up and read aloud the letter to the congregation. So Euodia and Syntyche are likely sitting in the congregation when this letter is read. 
and some of their neighbors and friends are sitting beside them or among them or near them. And that brings home the personal nature of how conflict happens in a community. It never happens generally. It always happens to people. And those people are important to our community. So Paul says, deal with this conflict at that level. Deal with this conflict as it represents people. Don't give up on two people that you need to be a part of your community. And then Paul moves on to suggest to them how they might overcome the nature of this conflict as a community. And he suggests that it is somehow through their actions and their attitudes that they will deal with this. Somehow through the practice of gentleness and prayer and thanksgiving and praise, somehow through those actions they will change the nature of this conflict. Somehow through the attitudes of truth, they'll counteract the attitudes of falsehood. Somehow through the practice of honor, they'll overcome dishonor that might be in the community. Somehow through seeking justice, they'll be able to overcome injustice. Somehow through the practice of purity, they will overcome impurity. And on and on the list goes. You get the point. Paul is calling the Philippian church to tune their mind toward the good. To think the best about Euodia and Syntyche. To think the best about each other. To find ways to affirm life even in the midst of conflict. What Paul is doing is what I often do in crisis marital counseling. I often find that when I have a couple sitting in front of me, that before long, what I discover in the conversation is that each is assuming the worst about the actions of the other. And the more they assume, the worse it gets, and the more the conflict rages. And I will usually say at some point early in the first session, you know, here's something you can do immediately. Whatever it is that he is doing that you think is wrong, or whatever it is that she is doing that you think is irritating, assume the best about it. Assume that it's not being done to make your world difficult or your head spin. Assume the best about your partner. And even if it's not true, it will at least change your way of thinking until you can get to a better frame of mind. This is what I think Paul is saying to the Philippian church. You know what? These two are probably not at their best. They're probably not acting in the way that you would want them to act. But in the midst of that, look for gentleness. Look for truth. Look for honor. Look for justice. Look for purity. Tune your mind toward the good and you can help to change this conflict in your community. Paul obviously had a goal in this word to the Philippians. Paul obviously has a goal that can be ours as well as we look at what happens when conflict comes to your community. And I think the first goal Paul had was that this community and our community find a way to grow through conflict. To recognize that in the midst of differences of opinion and differences of path and differences of mind and idea, we can become stronger. We can resolve the basic differences and agree to move forward and we can grow from conflict and not be overcome by it. I think Paul also had the goal of encouraging this community and encouraging our community to move forward in spite of the imperfections that are among us. I used to work with a guy 
who often said to new prospective members of the church we serve together, if you find a perfect church, don't join it. Because it won't be perfect once you've done so. And I think he meant at least a couple of things by that. I think he was trying to help people recognize that when you go into any community, you go with you. And you're not perfect. I think he was also trying to help people see that when you're standing on the outside of a community looking in, everything can look all pie in the sky, by and by, sweet, nice, kind, and good. But when you actually become a part of the community, you see what it really is. But it is only by becoming a part of that community that you can help it. It is only by becoming a part of that community that you can help move it forward. It is only by joining yourself with others that you can see your imperfections as well as they see your imperfections. Let's move forward, Paul said, despite the fact that we are imperfect. And I think Paul also had as a goal for the Philippians and for us that somehow we would make sure that the community continues as strong and as united as possible. That we would find a way to work through our differences and our difficulties until we get to a place that we all want to be that we would find a way to overcome our pettiness until we can become what God has intended us to be. I think that Paul wanted them to make sure that they didn't find themselves destroyed by this conflict, but they found themselves as strong and as united as possible. When I left Teleco Village, nearly two years ago now, they found somebody of my ideological stripe to take my place in that book group. And they continue to go forward, reading all kinds of things, engaging in all sort of spirited discussion, and never agreeing on much of anything, except that none of them are going forward without the rest of them that none of them are willing to give up on the idea that this community is important, that none of them is any more important than another. That seems to me to be part of what Paul was trying to say to the Philippian church and by implication to us. May God give us the grace to recognize that in the midst of inevitable conflict, we can grow stronger. We can become better. We can be more certain of who we are. And may God give us the grace to recognize that while we don't agree all of the time, each of us is important to this community moving forward. Amen. We're going to receive an offering at this time. May God bless the gifts that you have brought to give this day.